You might not have recognized uh, the young lady in the blue over there. That was Miss Taryn. She was about that tall uh, whenever they came through originally, and they were those little girls were singing with Mom and Dad. And, you know, Mom plays the upright bass, and Daddy played the guitar, and those girls would sing. And so here they were today and uh, still serving the Lord. Amen. 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 Boy, that encourages my heart, don't it, yours? We serve a God that's worth it. Amen. I appreciate the goodness of the Lord this morning. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Just, I, had, I got a message that's been just beating in my heart now for days. And uh, I, I never, you know, I, I'm a series guy. And I've been in the life of Christ now for, well, since I think Noah landed the ark. Seems like that long anyway on Sunday mornings. And uh, we're right up there to the apex. We're talking about the resurrection and, and, and everything there. And so we'll be there, Lord willing, next Sunday again. And uh, but sometimes God just pauses everything and says, this is it's right here. This is where it's at. And uh, this is where I want you to be this Sunday. So I'm going to be obedient to that. And so we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 this morning. And, uh, and we're going to, I'm going to start reading. I'm just going to read two verses, verses 14 and 15. Before I do, I want to, I want to kind, of, kind of set the stage, if I could. In, in 1 Thessalonians, by the time you get to what we call chapter number 5, the Apostle Paul here is wrapping up his first letter to the church at Thessalonica. And, and he makes the following statement in verse 14 as somewhat of a charge to the church at Thessalonica. Now watch what he says in verses 14 and 15 of 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and, he says, to all men. I don't know if you notice this when you read verses 14 and 15, but there are several commas there as he basically establishes different categories or classifications of people. Now listen to what I'm going to tell you. Not out in the community, but inside the church. All right? Look back in verse 14 with me if you would. He said, brethren... Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. And then he says this, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. He's talking about the types of people that were already present there in the church at Thessalonica. And he's telling those believers how they really should respond to and or work with side by side accordingly with these kinds of people. Now, we're living in a day and time where in our culture we hear st- these cliches all the time. Hey, man, let's keep it real, right? Let, 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 let's, let, let's be real about things. Well, that's what I want to preach on this morning. The message is simply entitled this, Real 
church. Not a facade, not a utopia that we make up, not what we think church should be like, but real church. Real church with real people. And what you'll find today is that if you were to walk into the church at Thessalonica, you know what you're going to find there? You're going to find the unruly and the feeble-minded. And you're going to find the weak. And he said, you know what? It's even possible while you're here that somebody might do you evil. You know what's amazing about this whole thing to me and Paul and his position? Paul's not apologizing for this. He says, this is just church. This is just church. And nowadays, whenever these situations surface, everybody thinks that we ought to apologize for church being church. No, maybe we ought to fix our theology. If we fix our theology and know what we ought to be looking for and what to expect, well, then you should not have as many letdowns when you encounter real church. Let's pray and ask God to give us some understanding today as we walk through the Word of God together. Father, we do love you this morning for one reason and one reason only, because you first loved us. And Lord, I want to pray this morning, if you would, that you would enlighten our understanding to the text. Lord, may you take today's message and do an eternal work in our lives. And our, our ultimate desire today is that the Lord Jesus would be glorified by and through the growth of his people. Help us, I pray, and we'll make sure you alone get all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we do ask. Amen and a man. Well, if there's one thing I could tell you this morning about church after being saved since 1998 and being a part of it is that it is messy from time to time. It is far from perfect. If you, Whenever you think about church, if you're looking for perfection, you have uh, assumed the wrong thing. As a matter of fact, not only is church messy from time to time, and not only is it imperfect, but at times it can even be stressful and leave you occasionally with an unsavory experience. And if you've been around very long at all, no doubt you probably could concur with that. But hey, if you want to get technical about it, it's exactly what God said that it would be. You won't find one time in the Bible where God paints this myriad or utopia of an expectation that some people have whenever they go to church. How many times living your life have you thought, well, I heard somebody say something like this. Well, can you believe so-and-so done such-and-such? I thought they were Christians. Right? Or can you believe this happened at the church? I mean, I thought them people were Christians. Well, there's a lot to be said about that, and we'll get into it momentarily. But understand this when it comes to church in and of itself. By definition, it's nothing more than an assembly of saved people. That's what church is by definition. Jesus said that upon the rock of Peter's confession that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, I will build my church. And all that means is this. I will build an assembling of called out believers. I will call believers out of the world and have them assemble so I can give them my heart's desire, my will, that they would carry that out all the days of their life. Now, with that being said, understand this. This assembly that we are participating in today, which the Bible calls church, does not, mean, does not mean in any way, shape, or form that we have achieved perfection. Listen to me now. While we may wear the name Christian this morning, it's not as much of an indication as to what we are as it is to what we hope to become. Yes, we are Christians if we're saved. That just means we are children of God, but we are not yet like Him to the degree that we want to be and that we need to be and that we hope to be. So we are on this journey of being transformed week by week, month by month, day by day, more and more into the image of Christ, but we're not there yet. From time to time, we surface. Things like you have already read here this morning in the text. And can I say, it's vitally important to understand and process because if you understand and process what church really is, it'll set your expectation level for what church life is going to be like. As a matter of fact, I'll say this this morning. You'll notice here, as I said earlier, the Apostle Paul makes no apology for what he is getting ready to expose about the church at Thessalonica. And instead, what he does is this, and this is the grand part you and I want to grab hold of. He doesn't apologize for the people that are in the church, but he tells the rest of the church how they should respond and interact with the classifications or groups that he has pointed out here in the text. 
And so that's what you and I are going to dive into this morning. Now, can I say this, that the overwhelming issues that people have with the church where they feel like, listen to me closely, the church has failed them, in reality, many times it's the opposite. They failed the church. You ever been hurt in church? Don't answer aloud. You might find out later it was your own fault. Because you had an unrealistic expectation. Amen. What do you mean, preacher? There are more people than you think that suffer in this regard from a little bit of Phariseeism. And here's what I mean by that. One of the, one of the charges Jesus made against the Pharisees in Matthew 23, in verse number 4, was he made this statement. He said, you bind heavy burdens and make it grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but you yourself will not move them with one of your fingers and the premise is this, you expect out of others what you yourself do not do, nor can you perform. And can I say, when it comes to church life, there's a lot of people that expect perfection out of everybody else, yet they cannot produce it in their own lives. And so they do suffer from a measure of Phariseeism. And can I say this morning, it's kind of this idea, rules for thee, but not for me. If I were to ask you this morning, are you still growing? You would say, yeah. If I were to ask you, do you make mistakes? I, you would say, yeah, if you were honest. If I even ask you, do you sin? For, yeah, I do. Well, then why would you not expect the same out of everybody around you? And when they do, why should it devastate us? So isn't it amazing how people get hurt at work and go back tomorrow? Get hurt at the family reunion and go back next holiday season. But church, now hey, they're a whole different standard for church now. The problem is, is they don't understand what real church really is. They don't understand what it's intended to be. And there are a lot of people, listen to me closely this morning, that are headed for the judgment seat of Christ, thinking that God is going to punish everybody that wronged them, only to get there and be rebuked. Because whenever they saw the humanity of other people in the family of God, they responded wrong. They did not meet the criteria of what the Apostle Paul is, is laying out here in this particular portion of Scripture. And can I say this morning, what this passage should do for you and I is set expectations of what we're going to find and experience in church so much so that I'll be honest with you, I'm putting this message in my church series. The reason I'm doing that, anybody who wants to join in the future will get a chance to hear this. So I don't want anybody walking into Lighthouse Baptist Church and expecting to find a flawless, perfect church that never has people making mistakes and growing. Oh, no, this is what you're getting when you come here. All right? This is what you will find. Maybe not in your first two or three weeks, but you hang around long enough. Everybody I talk, hey, let me just say this. Every category this morning that he talks about at the Church of Thessalonica is here. Every one of them is here. The question is, how good of a job is our church family doing uh, in its personal responsibility? So as we walk through, there are five categories here you're going to find this morning uh, of different people that the Apostle Paul points out in the church at Thessalonica. And inevitably, listen to me now, the uh, people are going to come to your mind as I preach through them. But here's your responsibility. First and foremost, make sure you can identify yourself. Lest Matthew 7 sneak up on you and you have a telephone pole in your eye. And then secondly, after you identify yourself and others, ask yourself this question. Not, why are they like that and when are they going to get better? But the real question for you and me is, am I responding the way God instructed me to respond? Let's get started this morning if we could. Look here in the Bible here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, the kinds of people we can expect to find in real church. Number one, we see the Apostle Paul first addresses what I call the wayward. He said, now we exhort you, brethren, watch this now, warn them that are unruly. If you're taking notes this morning, you can write this down. The word unruly simply means insubordinate. It's an individual that's being a rebel. They hear the same message as everybody else here, uh, but, but they, they do the opposite. In other words, they, and usually you'll find with these people, they like to flaunt what they do. They'll be the kind of people, yeah, I know the preacher preaches so-and-so, but I'm doing me, right? And then they'll mock and make fun and laugh and giggle and things of that nature. And uh, can I say this right here? Paul said that these people are to be warned. Warned. Why would Paul say warn 
or warn the unruly. Here's why he says that for. Because if you study your Bible when it comes to the subject of insubordination, you will inevitably find this. Insubordination always leads to destruction. You can find that in the life of Lucifer where insubordination led to his destruction. You can find it in the Garden of Eden where Adam's insubordination to God led to his destruction. And can I say this? From the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, everywhere you find insubordination, you find destruction. It's not cute. It's not something you laugh about. It, it, it is a big deal whenever an individual that claims to be a Christian and is a part of a local assembly is living in an insubordinate fashion. That is not something that somebody that loved you would look over. But let me, you know, Paul said warn them. Well, let me warn you before you warn them. Because according to Proverbs 9, 7, and 8, the Bible says this, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. And he that rebuketh a wicked man get it to himself a blot. What is he saying? That when you get down to the brass tacks of warning an unruly person, if they are truly a rebel at heart, most likely they're going to drag your name in the mud with them. They don't respond to correction very well. And so when you deal with them, you'll get shame on you, meaning they're probably going to try to turn it against you. And you'll get a blot on your name. So just be, be very careful when it comes to Matter of fact, the next verse he says this in Proverbs 9, 8, Reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. You can tell a lot about yourself in how you handle correction. When you're unruly and out of order and somebody approaches you and says, hey, I just want you to know that's out of bounds, how you respond to that? Is the next thing out of our mouths? Well, you do. Well, hang on a second. We ain't talking about me right now. We're talking about you. We can talk about me later, but right now we're talking about you, Right? Can I tell you this as a pastor? It's an unfortunate part of what we do, but I mean, if, if I preach the Word, two-thirds of it's corrective. Paul, When Paul told Timothy to preach the Word, he said this, reprove, rebuke, and then exhort with all long suffering, and make sure it's very doctrinal what you do. And can I tell you just by the nature of the beast that is called preaching the Word, I find this, that when I warn the unruly, there are two responses all the time. It's either, thank you, Pastor, for giving me the truth. I needed that. Or it starts a relationship of animosity and hatred. And can I say, if I were to die today, I'd go to my grave and not understand what I said that makes some people hate me so much. <laughs> but it's all right. Because it comes with the territory. The wayward, he said this again. And can I say that the wayward when it comes to attending Lighthouse Baptist Church should never find this the kind of church that's accepting of their behavior. Matter of fact, we want to do them the favor and the service of making being wayward out of vogue. We want wayward people to feel welcome but never comfortable. They say they're saved, right? And they're wayward. We want them to know, hey man, we love you. We're glad you're here. But that behavior is out of bounds. It's wrong and we ain't going to listen to it. Matter of fact, you're not going to find your way like that. You're, you can change and get right and get on board with what the Bible teaches, but if you don't, you're probably not going to. You may find a little posse because you know, birds of a feather flock together. Everybody can find their kind. But you're probably not going to be overall cheered in a place where they do their job and warn the unruly. So first of all, he identifies the wayward. Secondarily, he identifies the worrisome. Notice what he says. After saying warn them that are unruly, he says in verse 14, comfort the feeble-minded. Now, the word feeble-minded just simply means little-spirited or faint-hearted. And what it speaks about is this. Amongst a congregation, there are going to be some people that because of their disposition, they are riddled with fear. They lack courage. They can be intimidated by some of the things of life and or even some of the challenges that maybe living by faith may present to them. But notice what he said and how we should handle these people. He said not to warn the feeble-minded. No, 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 that's for the unruly. He said, I want you to comfort the feeble-minded. There'll be people among your congregation that struggle with things that are easy for others. And can I tell you what the common response is, unfortunately? 
When we see people that are feeble-minded, maybe they struggle with simplistic things in life that are just so easy for other people. A lot of times they so get on, uh, up under our skin that we have no patience with them. And so therefore, instead of comforting them, a lot of times we abandon them. They're going to require extra attention. They're going to need continually be, to be reassured that everything's going to be okay and that this verse applies to what you're going through. And, and, and if you'll just let the Lord help you, He can. And, and they may get victory in that one situation and six weeks later be in the same situation again because they're feeble-minded. Can I say this morning that what God has asked of the church is that whenever we find the feeble-minded among us that we don't ignore them, we don't cast them aside, but we comfort or the, the comfort, the feeble-minded. Number three, we see in verse 14, after looking at the wayward and the worrisome, we come across the weak that are among us and among every congregation around. Notice he said this, we are to warn them that are unruly. We are to comfort the feeble-minded. But then he said, here's the next thing I need from you to do. I need you to support, he said, the weak. Now, when you're talking about the weak amongst the family of faith, there are two different avenues that this ends up bearing itself out. And I'm just talking about what the Scripture teaches you and I. And I'll give you both of them. There's a twofold application. Number one, the Scriptures very clearly speak to us out of the book of Romans chapter number 14 about the possibility of an individual being weak in faith. They're saved, but they are weak in their faith. Here's what he said in Romans 14.1. He said, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. What does he mean about being weak in faith? Here's what he's talking about. There will be people inevitably, and we hope this is true, that get saved and because of the life they come out of, there may be some areas where they have a hypersensitivity to certain sins. They may not know uh, what they are allowed or not allowed to, to do and so therefore they may have a hypersensitivity and, and because of that, they may really wall themselves off and there may be a lot of things that they want nothing to do with because of their conscience that may not necessarily be wrong. Now stay with me. And the Apostle Paul tells us, tells us if that's the kind of weak we're talking about, he said that those weak people are to be supported. Matter of fact, if you were to look in Romans 14 this morning, here's what Paul said about our responsibility toward supporting the weak. He said this, Let us not judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. How do I support the weak among us? How do I support somebody that, that maybe gathers a conviction? I don't look at them and cast shade on them. I don't talk down about them. I don't call them silly names like legalists. I just say, hey, look, brother, it's okay. If that's bothering you, I, I'll deal with it on my end. We're living in a day where the, the church is being taught by apostate theologians uh, their supposed liberties and they flaunt them and ram them down people's throats. But can I say this? When's the last time you heard a message or were challenged and asked this question? What have you given up? Not because it's wrong, just so it won't affect anybody else in a negative way. That's, that's what b b not putting a stumbling block in front of somebody is all about. That means that biblically speaking, I know I got liberty here, but I also know this brother over here is weak in the faith. He don't understand my liberty, so therefore I will not let him see that in my life lest it become a stumbling block in his. You don't hear that anymore, do you? Oh, no, sir, buddy. The grace they're preaching these days is if I got it, I'm shoving it down your throat and calling you names if you don't agree with it. It's about as unspiritual of a generation as i maybe ever been recorded in church history. But he says, hey, I'm telling you now, if there's weak among you, support them. Um... I've pastored people before that had a different conviction in some areas than I had. I'll give you an example of one. And I am not throwing any shade. Jesus using this for example's sake. I've pastored people before that had decided not to have any influence of television in their home. And I do not think that's a bad conviction. <laughs> right? I don't have that conviction. But when they come over, it stayed off. I didn't invite them to my table to change them. I didn't invite them to my table to violate their conscience. I invited them to my table so I could love on them. And so I could support them. Even if I felt like the conviction really didn't bear any, 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 any biblical mandate. Support the weak. But when he's talking about the weak, he, he, he might not just be talking about the weak in faith. He could be talking about the weak in sin. Here's what I mean. 
While we're Christians, and as I mentioned earlier, we're all being conformed to the image of Christ, here's what you and I know. We're prone to stumble. If I were to ask us all, do we still struggle with sin from time to time? If you're an honest Christian, you do, right? Now listen closely to what I'm getting ready to tell you. And we got to know how to support these people. Now, let me make sure that I get real clear here. Supporting them is not dismissing what they're doing. It's not rubbing their back while they do it. Supporting them is saying, first of all, let me tell you something, brother. What you're doing is wrong. Okay? And once you confront the error and you smell a hint of repentance, that's whenever you say, hey, I'm going to help you. I want you to know, number one, I still love you. You know, Galatians 6, 1, brethren, if a man be overtaken and in a fault, you would start spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. How? Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Our job is to confront sin, to hold a brother accountable, and then when we see that spirit, that, that prodigal son type turn away from and turn toward the father, man, we don't want to be like the church at Corneth who was wrong on both sides of the fence. First of all, they're glorying in a sin they're not dealing with. When they finally decide to deal with it, they dropped the hammer so hard that Paul had to write him back and said, look, y'all, he's getting right. Let him back in. Like, hug the guy. Right? They're like, oh, no, man, you messed up. We ain't never going to like you again. You are trash. And Paul's like, oh, pump the brakes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You've overcorrected. You went from one ditch to the other ditch. Can I say this? People ought to be able to get right, come home. If they ever get to that place that the prodigal son was in where they come to themselves. Now the problem is a lot of times these days people want you to treat them and welcome them right back in. Whoa, 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 whoa. When did you have you come to the light moment? When did you repent of what you were doing? When did it become wrong? Because if it ain't wrong, we can't quite get back to where we were. But when they own it, if they own it, listen now, you and I have got to take the place of our responsibility is in restoration, not mutilation. So the Apostle Paul says that we are to, as far as responsibility-wise goes, support the weak. In verse 14, the last one he gives us in this verse, I told you there were five categories. We've worked our way up to the fourth one. The last one is those that are wearisome. He says this. He's told us to warn the unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, but watch what he says next. Be patient toward all men. Now, I call this group wearisome because they weary you. Just be honest. There are some people in your church family that get under your skin. On your nerves. And nobody said amen. Amen. Please don't say amen. This is not the time to say amen. We just, we just know. We don't have to talk about we just know. You know what Paul is telling us about this group? Everything we need to know, he's telling us by just talking about our responsibility. And he says, here's what I expect of you, patience. He said, patience is required of all for all. Why would Paul require patience toward all men for? Because there was a day in our lives when that's exactly what we were receiving from God. Patience. When we deserved judgment and condemnation, God granted patience. And after we got saved, guess what God has continued to delve out in truckloads? Patience. You might recognize it in your Bible in the form of the word mercy. Because here's the reason people get on our nerves, get under our skin. We say things like this to ourselves. Well, they're hearing the same preaching. I'm hearing it. Why ain't they getting it? <laughs> What's wrong with these people around here? You already heard two messages on that. You ain't got it yet. What's your problem? Hold up, Hoss. <laughs> right, calm down. There's some things in everybody's Christian life that just easy, natural. And then we've all got stuff that five, 10, 15 years deep in. Oh, we'll get victory for a little while and run, wild for a, run well for a while, and then mm, it gets us again. Right? And then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get straightened out on it. We'll run wild for, for a little spurt again. <clears throat> it gets us again. 
And not one time, not one time, has God said, oh, give you two strikes, three, pay ya, you're out of here. <laughs> right. Patience. Patience. He said, you need to have that toward all men, which means now this one right here is reaching outside the church and especially amongst the congregation. So we have the wearisome. Lastly, this morning, and this one came last in the text, but I'll also spend more time on it because the church of today seems to struggle more in this area than the others. Watch this in verse 15. He says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good. Here he goes now, both among yourselves in the church and to all men outside the church. Can I say this to you this morning? It is possible in church to experience some really dirty things, to be done really dirty. If, you, if, you're, if you're taking notes, write this down. The word evil there, by definition, means this. It means injurious and or to injure another. Okay? Now, here's something I don't know. Paul is telling us what might happen to us in church, that there may be some evil done to you, but he says, now, response-wise, what I don't want you to do is to render evil for evil. In other words, basically, the premise is this. Don't retaliate. Okay? Now, here's what I know. He says this may happen in the church, but now follow my train of thinking. He did not say it would come from necessarily saved people. But then again, if we're honest, we know everybody in church ain't saved. Might profess to be, but why would we ever assume that? See, this, this ends up kind of rolling into the reason he asked us to respond the way he does. Okay? The type of transgression here that's being implied speaks to the idea that most likely someone rendering evil to you, there's a real high chance they might not be born again. Let me tell you why I say that for. If you take the life of Christ, here's what you'll find out. The disciples hurt the heart of Jesus when they fled in the garden. They did. No doubt that hurt his heart. Though it was, he knew it was going to happen, he prophesied it hurt him. But Judas is the one that done him evil. And that he aided and abetted the angry mob, took the 30 pieces of silver, and sold out the Lord Jesus Christ. However, I will say this, what you will not find in the lives of the 11 that left that night from the garden is you will not find one time where they done any harm or damage to the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not injure him physically, and they did not injure him verbally. But in Judas, you find a traitor. Now, you can carry that away from the Lord Jesus Christ into the life of the Apostle Paul because if you study the life of Paul, the only time Paul ever hurt the church or the work of God was when he was lost. Matter of fact, before he got saved, that's exactly what he was doing. Was He was doing evil to the family of God in that he was the one that was in charge of executing the warrants for their arrest. He admitted to physically striking and putting his hands on both men and women of faith, not even to take into account the way he injured them with his testimony against them. Here's what Paul said in his testimony in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, verse 12. He said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me in the ministry. And then he said this, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. He said, But I did it ignorantly. Listen to this. In unbelief. You know what Paul said when he said, I was a man who was injurious? Basically what he said is this. I can't even believe God would save me and then put me to work in the church because I was the one that used to injure these people. I'd done much evil. He said, oh, I'm so ashamed. He said, but I just want y'all to know, for the record, I did every bit of it ignorantly in unbelief. Sad, is it not? Now listen closely. You may experience from time to time in real church some unintentional hurt from other genuine believers. But malicious activity that classifies as evil probably coming from a tear. The important thing, look in verse 15, is how we handle it. 
Here's what he said. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good among yourselves and to all men. You know what my responsibility is? Now, listen, it's a hard sell. Because when somebody's evil to you, when they seek to injure you, the natural response of the flesh is twofold. It's either fight or flight. But the Lord said, I don't want you to do either. I don't want you to render unto somebody. Don't, don't do unto them what they have done unto you. And is that not exactly what he told us in the book of Romans chapter 12? He said, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. He said, vengeance is mine. He said, I'll take care of that. You leave the vengeance in my hand. But you know what's interesting in the very next verse, chapter 12, verse 20 and 21? Listen to what he says. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. Here's why. Here's why. He said, no evil for evil. He said, for in doing so, thou shalt reap coals of fire upon his head. But he said, but not overcome of evil. Be not overcome of evil. Overcome evil with good. See, when someone is doing injury to you, no doubt they're operating in the flesh. And if they're natural, they have no other way to operate but in the flesh. So if we retaliate with that, now you got flesh fighting flesh and there's nowhere for God to work. But if we return to them Christ's likeness in treating an enemy like a friend with the goodness of feeding them if they're hungry and giving them drink, listen to me now, if they are in thirst, here's what it does. It defuses that situation and the hope is that it tenders their heart enough to see their condition before it's too late. Paul, when he was still Saul, standing at the, watching Stephen be stoned, holding the garments of the man, and he sees Stephen get all this vitriol from these people as they're stoning him, and he sees Stephen look up into heaven and call upon the name of God. Not one time did he chuck a rock back. And you talk about making a lasting impression upon Steve, uh, Paul's life. No doubt it led to his conversion by what he saw in the heart of that child of God. Now think about this. If someone is rendering to you evil, truly evil, that means they're headed for hell most likely. And I doubt very seriously any of us would ever say that anything's been done to us so dirty that you would want the retaliation and or the vengeance to be that they burn for eternity. So it's worth not falling into the trap of allowing our flesh to return fire with fire. Can I be honest with you this morning? Just transparent as I can be. As a young pastor, I failed in this area. I failed gravely as a young pastor because here's what I did wrong. I, I took the attacks personal without realizing, man, there's a spiritual element at work here that I couldn't see it with my eyes. I just always thought, man, this is personal and this is, you're attacking me, you know, and you're trying to injure me by slandering me. And, all, and I just took that personal. I didn't realize, I, at that time I wasn't mature enough in the Bible to understand, Jesus said you should expect this. Let me give you the verse that God used to change my life with. In, in, in John 15, 20, Jesus is having a conversation with the disciples, and here's what he said to them. He said, remember the word which I said unto you. The servant, talking to the disciples, is not greater than his Lord. He said, boys, y'all ain't no better than me. And then he said this, if they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they've kept my saying, they'll keep yours. Two categories of people. Now, now listen, listen, I'm getting ready to tell you because this is where it starts to really get real. This is before Calvary. All the persecution Jesus is talking about, none of it's physical. It's all verbal. It's all the slanderous accusations. Remember they said, he's not virgin born. He's a friend of sinners. He's a glutton, right? He's a sin. I mean, they just, that's all his enemies ever done. And the way they persecuted him, listen to me closely, they leveled slander after slander after slander at him. Why did they do that? Well, the very next verse, here's what Jesus says to those disciples. Can you listen closely? After he said, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. He says this. But all these things they do unto you for my sake because 
They know not him that sent me. You know what he said? Expect the persecution from the religiously lost. There's a downline to it. If you look in Luke's gospel, chapter 10, verse 16, he told the same disciples, the 70, I believe it was, that was getting ready to go out and preach. He said, he that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. People don't make that connection, but it's true. I didn't, I didn't understand that as, as a young pastor. I, did, I didn't get it. And so, as clear and as incriminating as that text is, here's what I learned as I aged in the scriptures. There was no reason for me to return fire to fire. That might run somebody out of church. No. If that's the way they feel, they need to be here. And I need to love them. And I need to keep preaching the gospel, believing this, that God can save them. Can I tell you that sometimes these stories have a happy ending? It's rare, but it happens. I've only seen it once or twice in my ministry. And it, it, you'll be honest with you, Brother Kirkman's here, and he, he spends most of his life trying to evangelize, you know, Mormons. Can I be honest with you? I've spent the majority of my life as a preacher of the gospel trying to see the Lord take the blinders off the eyes of religiously lost people. This is the South, y'all. Everybody's saved. Even whenever everything in the Bible says they're not, they will argue with you till they die. I am. And it's sad. But it don't matter how much vitriol they put at us, right? It, it ain't, I don't want to see them go to hell. I told you earlier, I said every once in a while, you'll see the Lord do a miracle and make a foe into a friend. I remember when the Parsons came here, Miss Tammy couldn't stand me. She, she told me after she got saved. She said, I could not stand you. She said, I wanted to leave, and I don't know why he wanted to stay. She said, you were so arrogant. That's what she told me. We laugh about it now. But here's why she said that for. She, I mean, they hadn't been, they hadn't come up two or three times. She came up to me out of one service and said, what do we need to do to join here? And I said, uh, let's just give it some time. Let's just give it some time. She said, hmm. You think, he don't think I'm good enough to join his church. I don't know what all she might have said about me. I don't want to know. <laughs> I do not want to know. But I tell you what happened. She ended up getting saved. Amen. And after that, the Lord has allowed us to build this, this fantastic Christ-honoring relationship and I count her now as a dear friend. Amen. I've only seen Grace do that a handful of times in my life. Matter of fact, now occasionally, every once in a while, she'll get wind that somebody's sideways with me. And she says, you want me to get my stick? <laughs> no sticks. We do not need any sticks. No sticks. <laughs> it's just, just kind of a Peter-type you know, affection for somebody like No sticks, Miss Tammy, not today. We're going to keep on preaching the gospel. <laughs> and, and hope to get saved. Amen. That's good. But I'll say this to the church. There's never going to be a time in any church you attend in America where there's not lost people that are members. Never. Never be a time when there's not unsaved among us. And if you experience evil and see it perpetrated, try to let this be the ruling factor in your heart and your head. Maybe the reason that fruit is so rotten is because there's something real important missing. So instead of doing what I want to do, which is getting even, I'm going to try to take the high road and pray and forgive and love and believe that God in his salvation can change it all. If today we start year 19, for 18 years I've seen a ton of people come in and out of these doors. A lot of them um, professing to be saved many of them genuine in that and a handful that I have felt so sorry for because I wouldn't die with what they live with. But getting even is not going to be what God uses to turn their heart. 
So I just showed you from two verses in 1 Thessalonians what real church is all about. Here's the question. How are we handling our responsibilities toward those people? Do not buy into this silly kindergarten spirit that exists in our society where everybody's been victimized. Wah, wah, wah. I hate to be so insensitive, but shut up. I'm a vomit, man. This is so ridiculous. I'm like, come on out of the kindergarten class and put your big boy shoes on and let's, let's buckle them babies tight and get to grow up and act like a Christian. You know, you either got to put a helmet on. Go through life with helmets and knee pads. Come to church with helmets and knee pads. What we, when, we, when we act like that, we testify the fact that, man, our Christianity, you can fill up a thimble with it. It's so weak. It's watered down and pathetic. Y'all don't be like that. God, help, please, get some mmm about you. And say, you know, it's my responsibility to love them people who aren't perfect. And I'm not perfect. And so I'm just going to act like a Christian. I'm going to take the challenge. And if you and I will get where Paul's got us right here, we won't walk around all the time squalling and crying, be on social media posting about how, oh, I'm going to hurt her offended, I'm going to hurt her Oh. And then, and then you got these dummies every day trying to apologize for the, well, I'm so sorry the church done this and the church done, I'm like, I ain't sorry for nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry for what I do. I ain't sorry for the rest of it because I got a Bible. It's real church. Unless you quit your job and abandon your family for the same stuff. And if you do, you need therapy. Every head bowed, every eye closed.